while the choir is getting settled, why don't you open up your Bible to 833. You can see that we're real people and we don't always proofread carefully. So it's in your bulletin, it's 833 in your Bible. Or you may, as always, just listen to the word. Before we hear the word, let us pray. Lord, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Jesus our single concern. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Peter and John have spent a night in prison after healing a man who was paralyzed from birth. After this, they were preaching that in Jesus, there is resurrection from the dead. And upon hearing this word and seeing this miraculous healing, 5,000 people came to the Lord. Peter and John, in this story this morning, are now surrounded by a pretty impressive lineup of pretty important religious people. There's the chief priests and the elders and all who were about the temple. So I want you to imagine that as Peter and John are now interrogated by these religious leaders. This is what follows. The word comes to us today from Acts chapter 4, verses 7 through 31. When they had made the prisoners, that is Peter and John, stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are now asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they recognized, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than God, you yourselves must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. 
For all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. After they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, it is you who by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, said, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers had gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel have gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, Look at their threats. Grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathering was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. With boldness. Friends, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. There was a man who was lame from birth, who daily was brought in from the strength of others and laid at a gate called Beautiful. He begged for money each day at the beautiful gate. One day, as Peter and John were going to midday prayer, they saw him. But unlike everybody else, they really saw him. I want you to think about this image of people swarming around the temple gate. The really busy place, and so how I want you to imagine it, is I want you to picture the streets of Climber yesterday during the yard sale. <laughs> how many of you were at the yard sale? Because I was. <laughs> From our spot, maybe here in the middle of town, maybe some of you were having your own garage sales and weren't able to get out, but from our spot here in the middle of town, it was like a parade out there. It was full of people in cars and parents pushing their kind of cranky toddlers down the street and people with bags full of things they had bought. So many people and so much commotion. Well, I've been anticipating this yard sale for the whole eight months that we have been living here. <laughs> and the great wonder has said that my sweet parents and my sister and her fiance were here. And so Noah and I took a date in the morning and left Rowan with them and went out to the garage sale. So when we came back a couple hours later, it was just swarming with people. I want you to envision people all around the temple coming in and out because it was such a it was a it was a this, this church is a busy place for the week, but I think it was probably a little bit more um, in in Jerusalem at this time, maybe more like it would have been um, yesterday with the people kind of coming and going all the time. So Peter and John, this crowd of people, pass by this man, see him, and he expects, just like everybody else, to receive coins. But you remember, this is what Pastor Noah preached on last week. Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And this man being taken by the right hand by Peter, stood up and began to weep and dance and sing, and all of the people saw it. This man was healed. Peter and John, because this is a very public moment, 
quickly say, this is not from our own power or piety that this happened. It was only by the name of Jesus. Enter today where the fallout of this story is happening and Peter and John are in the temple being interrogated by those whose job it was to make sure the doctrine and kind of the purity of the church was being kept up. This is really, honestly, nothing wrong with that. They were wondering, by what name did these men come in? So they asked them, by what name or by what power did you do this? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, it's Jesus, the one you crucified, the one that God raised from the dead, the one that the psalmist in Psalm 2 says, the one, the stone that was rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given among anyone by which we must be saved. It's Jesus, the only name that can set us free. Now, then and now, it's true to say that to claim this, that there is salvation in no one else, is what you say uh, exclusive. It's very exclusive. For some, it seems arrogant to say that there is salvation in no one else but Jesus. For some, it just seems like a fairy tale, a quaint saying, there is salvation in no one else but Jesus. Hearing there, that there is salvation in no one else is threatening. Some may say that, you know, there's just one mountain, and there's all these different paths that lead up, but it's all the same top. All religions basically are teaching the same thing. There's a sentiment from the bestseller called, this book called Eat, Pray, Love, where the author, New York Times bestseller, the author says this, you have every right to cherry pick when it comes to moving your spirit and finding your peace in God. You have every right to cherry pick when it comes to moving your spirit and to finding your, your peace in God. You know, it feels good to choose our own adventure, to live with the limits we want in our lives. The climate around us, and if we're honest, in us, is suspicious of this claim. It seems easier for us to keep our religious life private. So it's really just between us and Jesus, and there aren't any kind of cultural ways. So what do we do with this claim? There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among mortals by which we must be saved. Even for Christians, there is this functional belief that we think that really salvation is Jesus plus us. Now, I'm not saying that salvation doesn't deeply, deeply, deeply involve change, transform us. But I think we think that what we really need is to be a little bit more faithful in loving other people. We need to be a little more faithful in reading the Bible and being in prayer. What Peter and John knew, though, was that this was not of their own power and piety. They were very involved, but it was 100% the power of Jesus Christ to make this happen. What Peter and John know, and the same truth that Christian today stands on, is that there is no way to fill up our lives that satisfies. There is no other stability or security or certainty that can complete the sense of wandering or restlessness. There is nothing you can buy or ingest or receive promise for that can fill up our lives. St. Augustine, writing centuries ago, says, 
Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. The religious leaders didn't want Peter and John to make too many waves in the social scene. And I would say 5,000 people coming to the Lord was a pretty big wave. (laughs) Peter and John are sent out, and the religious leaders say, don't speak anymore in Jesus' name. They threaten them and let them go. But Peter and John boldly say, how can we keep from speaking, from what we have seen and heard. They return to their friends. They return to those who have come to the Lord, who have been walking with Jesus, from the disciples and also a larger group of people. And they tell them what they have seen and heard. You see, when we proclaim Jesus is Lord, it is not a matter of personal opinion. Jesus is Lord. There is salvation in no one else. We need a story so reliable, so faithful and consistent, so true and abiding, that it makes sense of everything else in our lives. It's a story that our lives are seen through. There is salvation in no one else. When Peter and John come back to their friends. They hear the story. And they lift their voice together in prayer. And what they pray is a scripture-shaped prayer. They pray, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Lord, it is you who told us that this would happen through your servant David. It is you who said we would experience trouble. It is you who said that there would be persecution and difficulty. And now, Lord, your leaders of the temple have gathered against your servant Jesus. And this next move is what's so interesting. And now, Lord, look on their threats. They don't say convert them. They don't say, you know, how to punish them. They don't say any of those things. They say, Lord, see this. Look at this. Look at us. Look on their threats. Even as you stretch out your hand to heal, and mighty deeds are performed in the name of Jesus. The church needs to learn in every generation what it is to pray with boldness and confidence like this. Jesus promised the road that leads to destruction is wide and easy, and the road that leads to life is narrow and hard. In the face of persecution, or whatever else threatens our faith, fear or anxiety, or apathy and listlessness, lack of direction, wondering how life will unfold after a significant life event. In anything else in all creation, we have the confidence to say, Jesus is on the throne. I give that to you as a gift. When, whatever, that's kind of the best answer to say to anyone in the, in the middle of pain, tragedy, when we feel that. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. And we are to boldly announce this truth. We can be very bold, even if we don't feel very bold. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence, promise that we can find grace and help in our time of need. We can bring the whole of our lives to Jesus. In this last week, I've said this to several people. Jesus can take everything we have to give him. There is nothing that he did not nail to the cross. There is nothing that he will not take up on our behalf now. Christians do not so much claim to know the truth. They claim that they have been apprehended by the truth. Christians don't claim to be the wisest one. They proclaim to have known and to know the only wise one. If all Christians had to offer was another spirituality, another ethic, another way of being good, then that would be all mounts, all roads lead to the same mountain. That is not the heart of the gospel. 
The heart, the heart of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, the one who died and was raised, is the one through the Holy Spirit that is working to reconcile all things in this world. Noah and I, several years ago, were in a regular rhythm of serving communion at an evening, a weekly evening college service. And it was a large group, several hundred people, and we would stand there in several stations around the sanctuary holding bread and juice. And I wish you could see it, and maybe you can in your mind's eye right now, just the streams of people coming forward, coming forward, coming forward, and the whisper of words over and over, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Over and over and over. And it was sort of like a wash of that. But I remember one time a woman came up, a woman that I knew. And as we said those words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, she said very quietly, Alleluia. And that about me, we had to sit down. Something about that just unlocked something in me. It was so beautiful and true. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Alleluia. Our lives really do reduce down to living in these words. Friends, there is salvation in no one else. And there is no other name given among mortals by which we must be saved. Jesus is Lord, and he is on the throne and we can approach that throne with boldness. And so, to this truth, we say, Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we all say, Amen. Amen. Lead us, Lord Jesus, to be bold, to speak these words with every atom of our being, that you, Jesus, are Lord, and there is salvation in no one else. Lord, continue leading us into the deep ways of your kingdom. We all pray this in your name, O Christ. The people of God said, Amen. Amen.